Davidson Corporation Foundation. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hewitt Shaw, the president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, David W. Blight, professor of history at Yale University and the winner of this year's Annisfield Wolf Book Award for his book, American Oracle, The Civil War um, in the Civil Rights Era. This award was established in 1935 by Cleveland poet and philanthropist Edith Annisfield Wolf to honor written works making important contributions to the understanding of racism and the appreciation of the rich diversity of human culture. And since 1963 has been administered by the Cleveland Foundation. So it is particularly meaningful to have Professor Blight with us today at the City Club of Cleveland. You may have seen in today's uh, Plain Dealer that the award ceremony was last night. It got uh, rave reviews, as did uh, the professor's presentation last evening. Other notable winners of this award include Martin Luther King Jr. in 1959 for his book, Stride Toward Freedom, The Montgomery Story, and past City Club speakers FX Tool, Vernon Jordan, Stephen Carter, Derek Walcott, and Isabel Wilkerson. In addition to his accomplishments as the author of this and other books dealing with the Civil War and how American society grappled with its aftermath, he is the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University, and for the students in our audience today, importantly for all of you, started his career in academics as a high school teacher. Uh, which um, was probably an, as important a part of his experience as any, any others that he had uh, through his uh, travels to Yale University. As we continue as a nation and in our local communities to confront our challenges of racial equality and inclusion, it is important to be reminded of the historical context of this great social issue. I'm therefore pleased to present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland David W. Blight, Professor of History at Yale University and recent winner of the Annisfeld Book, Book Award. Thank you so much, Hewitt. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it is, to say the least, a great honor to speak uh, within and to the tradition of this institution. I've been learning a great deal about the City Club the three days I've been in Cleveland. And I see some familiar faces who were at the ceremony last night, so you got softened up last night and you'll, <laughs> you'll be easy on me. What an extraordinary event that was, celebrating books, 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 books. I want you to go with me, if you will, back to an event everybody knows about, including, I suspect, our students here today. You don't need to nod yes in case it's not the case, but <laughs> I bet you've had to memorize some piece of this. A breeze eased the intense heat of the late August afternoon as the huge crowd, weary but peaceful and jubilant, leaned forward to listen. All along the reflecting pool of the Washington, D.C. Mall, people steadied their sore feet and peered up at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, that, of, that unofficial secular temple of the United States. Martin Luther King Jr., a Southern Baptist minister who had become the preeminent face and voice of the civil rights movement, stepped to the microphones and delivered a short transcendent oration to the world on the meaning of the unfinished American Civil War and thereby the meaning of America. On August 28, 1963, as we all know, King gave what should be considered the most important Civil War centennial speech of that turbulent and divisive commemoration in the 60s. As American society engages the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, which we're doing now, 
And we are about to have that sesquicentennial, indeed, of the preliminary and final Emancipation Proclamations next week and then in January. King's famous address demands a hearing, or better, a reading. Read it. Don't just pull it up on YouTube, although you can do that too. <laughs> and what will always be known is the I Have a Dream speech. That dream metaphor emerges late in the speech, um, and it emerges extemporaneously. The first 14 minutes of that speech are scripted, beautifully scripted in poetic prose. The last three, four minutes of the speech about the dream was extemporaneous. Now, he had practiced and laid out that metaphor in many other speeches before. It wasn't as though he just plucked it out of the air. In the second sentence, King announced the text of his sermon. And he suggested the historical weight of that moment. And he began to employ other unforgettable metaphors than the dream. The opening lines are, five score years ago, a great American, the big fellow up behind him, in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a beacon of light, I'm quoting King, a beacon of light, of the light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled in the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on an island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro still languished, is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. That's the opening of that speech. It's not the part we hear in commercials. It's not the part used for sound bites about an American dream. No one at that event, or watching it on television, it was televised, or for that matter, who reads it or witnesses the speech today on a video, if they witness the entirety of it, can miss the significance of his use of five score, a clear and poignant reference to Abraham Lincoln's use, of course, of four score and seven years ago in the Gettysburg Address. As Lincoln implied in that brief address at Gettysburg Cemetery in November of 1863, the Civil War, the outcome of which at that point was still far from determined, necessitated a new founding, a redefinition, a reinvention of the United States, rooted somehow in the destruction of slavery and the reborn, ill-defined principle at that point of human equality. And let's not forget that Lincoln actually mouthed the word equality in the Gettysburg Address. In the dream speech, King argued exactly the same thing for his own era. He gave the Gettysburg Address of the 20th century. The Civil Rights Revolution heralded yet another refounding in the same principle 100 anguished years after Lincoln's promise. But the Civil War and, the, and Civil Rights have been forever intertwined in our history and in our deepest mythology. But in the period of the centennial of the Civil War from the 1950s to the mid-1960s, these two phenomena, the Civil War and Civil Rights, were often like planets in separate orbits around separate suns. For 17 magnificent minutes, the power of King's rhetoric broke down the segregated gravitational pulls of those two planets and brought them into the same orbit, at least for a moment. But befitting his role, as the leader of a radical, if nonviolent, protest movement, 
King's arguments were hardly mainstream, lest we forget, in the Cold War American political culture of 1963. It's very easy to forget today, our youth, how radical those words were, no matter how soft and pleasing they can seem today. In the year of the assassination of John F. Kennedy and worldwide exposure of vicious racism and violence and the civil rights crisis in the South, as before and since, the meaning of the Civil War was the most divisive element in our national historical memory. And by the early 1960s, some Americans had learned and accepted the idea that the war had been, in one way or another, caused by slavery, and its principal result had been the emancipation of four million slaves and the preservation as well as recreation of a new union. But that story was yet to find any consensus at that point in public memory. For the majority of Americans then, especially of white Americans, even as they watched civil rights marches, marchers clubbed by police and bitten by dogs in Birmingham, Alabama on television, to claim the centrality of slavery and emancipation in Civil War memory was still then an awkward kind of impoliteness at best and a dangerous heresy at worst. In 1963, the national temper and mythology still preferred a story of the mutual valor of the blue and the gray to the troublesome, disruptive problem of black and white. Now, I wanted to place you there, because it's, it's a place we've all been in some ways, whatever age we are. We know that speech, we know that moment, we know that imagery. <sighs> but a little background to it. About two weeks after John Kennedy was inaugurated president in early February 1961, Martin Luther King's staff, particularly his lawyers on the on SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Council, started lobbying the White House. Uh, first with telegrams and then with letters, they started lobbying the White House for what they called explicitly a second emancipation proclamation. They wanted Kennedy to consider issuing an executive order as president, just as Lincoln had, outlawing racial segregation forever in the United States, executive order. Now, that campaign uh, is little known today. It's appeared in a couple of books. I've written about it now in American Oracle. I actually had a senior essay student at Yale last year do a brilliant senior thesis on this very document that, that SCLC and King's staff produced. They began to lobby key people in the White House. Harris Wofford, who was the sort of chief lawyer for civil rights in the White House. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger, who was a historian in residence at the White House, and for all things historical, Kennedy's advisor. And they heavily lobbied Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General. And what they eventually drafted was a 65-page manifesto. I actually have a copy of it with me. I carry it around. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, but I do. They produced a 65-page manifesto which they which King, for which King held a major news conference in Washington, D.C. on May 17th, 1962, the following year, and then delivered to the White House. Uh, its opening four-page preamble probably was written by King. It has his voice in it. Um, I say probably because we can't know for sure. He is listed as the... Uh, the only author of the document, which simply isn't true. The rest of the document, some 60 pages, is a legal brief. It's a heavily precedent-laden legal brief written by his staff of lawyers, just lining up the precedents through history that they believed gave the president, under these circumstances of, of what racial segregation had done to America, what Jim Crow had done to America, to issue such an executive order. But in that preamble, 
King manages to quote in four pages everyone from Jefferson's Declaration of Independence to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land, Bruce Catton from his turning point moment in Terrible Swift Sword, the great narrative history about the Antietam campaign that led up to the Emancipation Proclamation, Frederick Douglass's autobiography, he even quoted Albin Tourget, which you've all forgotten, who was the most important novelist of the Reconstruction era, and last but not least, JFK's book, Strategy for Peace. I quote the president there, right, if you're lobbying him. And then comes the legal brief. That legal brief was largely written by an African-American lawyer named Clarence Jones, who is still alive, lives, in, uh, he lives in Stan at Stanford, in Palo Alto, California. We reached him last year by phone. He's well in his 80s. And he said to me on the phone, oh, yeah, that document, uh, it's, the most, uh, it's the proudest thing in my life, most important thing I ever did. Now, they delivered this document to the White House in May 18, 1962, and nothing came of it, as we know, historically. Um, but it's worth pondering for just a second. Why were they lobbying for an executive order? Why weren't they lobbying Congress? Well, as many of, in this, many of us in this room would know, Congress at that point, they had no confidence in. It was dominated by Southern Democrats. It was dominated by Southern segregationist Democrats, the chairmanships of most committees. They had no real hope that legally, from the federal government, the end of Jim Crow would ever come from Congress. That's why they're appealing to the president. They thought they had a president now who, and when they did, who was at least sympathetic to civil rights, for sure. Ironically, of course, history always surprises us. <laughs> That's why people in my profession never want to predict anything. Um, <laughs> and don't ask us to. Because we probably will. I mean, that's, that's the danger. Ironically, in the wake of Kennedy's death and LBJ taking over uh, the 64 Civil Rights Act and changes in the nature of Congress by them because of, of uh, elections, we did get the magnificent 64 Civil Rights Act and the 65 Voting Rights Act from a Congress, a bipartisan Congress at that time. Remember when we had those. <laughs> I point this out simply because civil rights and the Civil War were all over the rhetoric of that era. It, it, it's all over Kennedy's speeches. Ted Sorensen, of course, who wrote Kennedy's speeches, uses metaphor after metaphor after metaphor, if you actually go back and read JFK's speeches from the Civil War. They even called the Cuban Missile Crisis the Gettysburg of the 20th century. Now, a little reflection with you about where this problem of Civil War memory <laughs> came from in its career up to that point of the centennial. And then a little reflection on where we are now at the sesquicentennial. I wrote a book a decade ago called Race and Reunion, where I did what most historians do. I, I boiled masses of complicated information and research down to three kinds of memory. When in doubt, use a trinity. The human mind is somehow conditioned for it. Don't name four things, only three. <laughs> but I said there were essentially three kinds of Civil War memory. Now, I've been challenged on this since, and most of the challenges are correct, but <laughs> the first I called reconciliationist memory. Now, we know what that means. This was the desperate need, the urge for reunion of North and South. It was born or took root in the tremendous challenge of dealing with the dead on a scale no society had ever really faced. Um, the second kind of Civil War memory I called emancipationist memory. This was embodied in the way the war came to destroy slavery and launch black freedom. Uh, it was em embodied in or rooted in uh, radical reconstruction or the radical Republicans' vision of how to remake an American republic. And it, would, of course, was rooted in those three great Civil War constitutional amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. <laughs> and the third kind of memory, and none of these have ever ended, by the way, <laughs> the third kind I called white supremacist memory. 
This was the kind of memory rooted in the idea that the races, black and white, could never really be equal, that America could not be a biracial, a true biracial society, that emancipation may have been inevitable, would say some in the lost cause tradition, but it came too fast, it came by force, and black people simply weren't prepared for it. The blacks were not only unprepared for freedom, they were unprepared to be citizens exercising civil and political rights. This vision of a white supremacist America locked arms with the reconciliationist vision and delivered the country a segregated memory of the Civil War by at least 1900, and it was that segregated memory of the Civil War that we were still contending with at the centennial 50 years later, uh, 100 years after the war. Now, what America faced after the Civil War, we now believe as many as 750,000 Americans died in the Civil War. The old figure of 620, official number, has been recently and quite, it appears, successfully challenged by a young historian named David Hacker. At any rate, with 700 to 750,000 Americans dead, a republic destroyed, the challenge to reinvent it in constitutional amendments that could never have been conceivable even four years before, Americans faced this challenge between two awesome tasks. One was healing. How do you heal after massive civil war where the enemy is not going to leave? <laughs> and they're not a foreign country. At least most of them aren't going to leave. The second challenge was justice. And how do you find a balance over time in law, in politics, in society, and in the hearts of citizens between healing and justice? Who's healing? Who's justice? What healing meant to a white southerner who faced Sherman's march to the sea, and what healing meant to the parents of dead sons in the North, were different questions. What healing meant to the freed people, trekking by the thousands behind Sherman's army, and he didn't want them trekking behind his army, was a very different matter than what justice or healing might mean on the floors of Congress when debating the 14th Amendment. In the United States, we had no Truth and Reconciliation Commissions to adjudicate how to get over the Civil War. Those were 20th century ideas, really late 20th century ideas. Healing and justice after our Civil War had to happen in history and through politics and therefore in the messy, politicized, terrible process of debating historical memory. And we've never quite stopped debating it. Now, I actually want to end by making us think about now. Uh, it's a cliche to say, well, the legacies of the Civil War have always been with us, right? It's easy to say that. It's easy for historians like me to say that. But what do we mean when we say that? How do you know a legacy when you meet one? How do you know a collective memory when you meet one? Mm. We live in a society now, 2012, still polarized. That's the operative word now, right? We're all polarized over race, over ethnicity, over the advent of a black president, the meaning of a black president. We try not to think about that, don't we? He tries not to think about that every day. Imagine being Barack Obama. You have to get up every day and say, I'm supposed to be the black president. Well, but then I got this embassy just got bombed. We're polarized, we're told, over the rights of immigrants, over religious tolerance, over birthright citizenship, that sacred language and the first line of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, written by that great Ohioan, John Bingham, who deserves a statue in Statuary Hall in Washington, but doesn't have one. We're supposed to be polarized over a seemingly permanent state of war, it appears. We're also riven by a conflict over federalism, the never-ending debate in America about the proper relation of federal to state power, 
that union, the name so many Civil War generation Americans, at least Northerners, uh, came to use for the United States is not so healthy an organism, it appears, at the 150th anniversary of that event. Yes, the Civil War was rooted in states' rights, but the significance of any exercise of states' rights is always in the issue to which it is employed. States' rights is never employed just to employ it. It's employed for a reason, for a function of some kind. In 1860 and 61, some Southerners exercised their state sovereignty, as they called it, as an act of revolution in the interest, as they said themselves, over and over again, of preserving a racial order founded on a system of human slavery. Today, states' rights claims are advanced by many governors and, frankly, Republican majority legislatures in the very language sometimes of secession and even nullification, made so infamous in antebellum, or we thought infamous, in antebellum America. They are aided and abetted by a conservative majority on the Supreme Court, although I don't think the justices have ever, so far as I know, actually employed the word nullification. Although we may have the most states' rights Supreme Court right now that we've had in perhaps a century. What has brought those words like nullification uh, back into our political parlance and in the service of whose interest, what has brought them back, and in the service of whose interest have they come back? When the Texas legislature debated making the Transportation Safety Administration's new pat-down examinations impermissible on Texas soil, they were exercising their state's rights. And given the hold that the Tea Party appears to have on the base of the Republican Party, as well as some of its recent presidential candidates, perhaps we should take notice for the good of the larger nation when that group, the Tea Party, invokes the Confederate Constitution of 1861 on many of their websites, which they do if you look up their websites. They may need a reminder, if they're going to continue to invoke the Confederate Constitution, of just how desperately the Jefferson Davis administration struggled to forge a centralized government out of the chaos of war, jealous localism, states' rights, and homegrown individualism. Jefferson Davis faced the same problem of creating a central government as has every other American president. Indeed, I'd argue that the secessionists of 1861 and the Tea Party advocates of 2012 have much in common. Both are distinct minorities who have suddenly seized an inordinate degree of power. One acted in revolution to save a slaveholder's republic. The other seems determined to render the modern federal government all but essentially obsolete for any purpose other than national defense. Both claim their mantle of righteousness in the name of liberty, privatization, and racial exclusion, one openly, the other covertly. Both vehemently claim the authority of the Founding Fathers as though the American Revolution and the creation of the U.S. Constitution have no history. Both have embraced a version of federalism we once might have thought all but buried in the mass slaughter of the Civil War. But alas, history just keeps on happening. And if you want to find, I'll spare you all the litany of examples one could use, if you want to find uh, the best place to look for this revival of states' rights that's going on now. And I'm not saying states' rights is always a bad thing. It's how women's suffrage actually came about. It happened at state level first. It's how gay rights has first come about. It's at the state level first. This is, oh, this is a mixed story. But if you want to find the revival of states' rights, go look at, re at Republican-controlled legislatures in about 30 to 35 states where there are hundreds and hundreds of bills designed to take power from the federal government, whether it's about environment, protection, endangered species, interstate commerce clause, et cetera, it's what the FBI can do or not do within a state, and on and on and on and on. 
back to the states, not to mention the health care law, not to mention many other things. Let me just end as the clock descends by quoting Robert Penn Warren, who is the subject of one of the chapters in this new book of mine, the great Southern novelist, poet, writer, essayist, Kentucky-born, infused in his youth at the knee of his grandfather, the Confederate veteran with lost cause tradition and who spent his glorious writing life, in my view, overcoming it, <laughs> struggling to overcome it at times, perhaps sometimes not fully overcoming it, other times, yes. And if you haven't read All the King's Men, I think you shouldn't be able to have US citizenship unless you read All the King's Men. <laughs> but that's just my view. He wrote a little book in 1961 called Legacy of the Civil War. Uh, it's still the place to start if you want to read about the memory of the Civil War. He wrote it for Life magazine. It's a long essay. It's a fascinating meditation on how the Civil War is kind of in the American bloodstream. In it, he said, the Civil War, quote, reaches in a thousand ways into our bloodstream and our personal present. And he's saying that in 1961. It's not untrue today. He demanded in that book and many other places that Americans see it, the war, civil war, as their authentic national tragedy. And to use that word in its tragedy, that is, in its, quote, deepest significance, the image in action of the deepest questions of man's fate and man's attitude toward that fate. We should, in my view, not clean up this great story about our Civil War for polite conversation, nor should we feed the beasts of romance or the sense of unity that sometimes we demand out of, of a usable past of our Civil War without really looking at what it was about and what it wrought. Robert Penn Warren was a huge Melvillian. Herman Melville was his favorite author. There may be a few in this room, too, who just refer to Moby Dick as the book. <laughs> he ended his essay, Legacy of the Civil War, by going back to Melville. He went to the supplement to Melville's famous collection of Civil War poetry, published in 1866, called Battle Pieces. And he quoted Melville. The passage is, let us pray, said Melville, 1866, a year right after the Civil War ends. Let us pray that the terrible historic tragedy of our time may not have been enacted without instructing our whole beloved country through its pity and terror. Melville pleaded, uh, that is, Warren, excuse me, after quoting Melville, then pleaded, have we been instructed, he asked, by that war? And Warren's answer was, quote, in 1961, sadly, we must answer no. We have not yet achieved justice. We have not yet created a union, which is, in the deepest sense, a true community. And I just suggest that as we experience this 150th anniversary of emancipation and the Civil War, that we ask ourselves the same question. How have we been instructed by that experience? Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring David Blight, professor of history at Yale University and winner of this year's Anisfield Wolf Book Award for his book, American Oracle, The Civil War in the Civil Rights Era. We will return to our speaker momentarily for the traditional City Club questions. Please formulate your questions now and remember to make them brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening to W.3 WCPN Idea Stream, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WBIZ PBIC, PBS Idea Stream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC Bank.
Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Closed captioning of our program is made possible by the Nordstrom Corporation. Today we welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler and the Cleveland Foundation. Thank you for your support. We would also like to welcome students who are here as part of the City Club student program. Today's student attendance is made possible by a gift from the Fred E. Scholl Foundation, Bernard Carr Chairman, and Porter Wright Morris LLP. Will the students please stand to be recognized. Today is the Karen F. Witt and A. H. Weinstein Memorial Forum on the Persecutions of People, made possible by a generous gift from the families of Karen Witt and A. H. Weinstein. Thank you for that support. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is City Club Program Director, Carrie Miller. May we have the first question, please. Well, I have an observation and a comment after thanking you for your remarkable presentation. Thank you. The observation is this Civil War wasn't so long ago. <laughs> when I was 10, my mother took me to meet a man who was a snare drummer at the Gettysburg Address, my who God. reminisced about his experiences. Can I shake your hand before I leave? And I must, <laughs> I must say I've forgotten everything you said. <laughs> Make it up. We but won't that, care. <laughs> <laughs> what a thing for a history professor to say. <laughs> and I would like... Wasn't that Mark you, Twain's definition of history? Yeah. Anyway. I would like to ask you, is this forever balance or, or, or dissonance between states' rights and federal rights, hmm. I see it as sort of a trajectory of historical events. What do you see coming? So the first question is not what if Lincoln had lived. It's, <laughs> it's asking me to predict. Uh, historians are terrible predictors of what's coming in, in federalism. Um, oh, I suspect more of the same. I mean, whatever happens with this election, we're in a long-term states' rights revival uh, in the courts. Uh, now, that, of course, does depend on who end up judges in this country, and that does depend on elections, of course, but that's a long-term process, as we know. The Supreme Court is up for grabs, but uh, that's decades, perhaps, before we have fundamental change on the Supreme Court. Um, we do have some huge modern 20th century dilemmas and problems um, about how to provide about what the social contract is anymore, um, about whether we can afford a social contract as we've managed to create one in the 20th century. But it does seem to me that what is up for grabs, whether it's in this election or in our long-term historical process, is whether we will actually preserve a social contract like the one that the Civil War first initiated. I guess I'd just add to that something I argued a couple of days ago at Case Western in a lecture. The American Civil War actually ought to be seen as the second American Revolution. And if you look around scholarship among historians, we've been, many of us have been saying this for decades now. You look at the preface of, of most books now about the politics or social change wrought by the Civil War, and you'll see this language of a second revolution. It's really what Lincoln was arguing in the Gettysburg Address, if you go read it again. Lincoln is actually saying the first republic, the one founded 80-some years ago, is dying. It's being destroyed in this war. It's being buried in these graves. We have to invent a new one. The new one he helped invent, the war helped invent, the original Republican Party helped in invent, at that time, like it or not, was a highly, and for its time, a highly centralized federal government. It took a highly centralized federal government to win the Civil War. I could go into detail. It took a highly centralized federal government to win the Second World War. Um, you know, we've built in the 20th century a social contract. Will the 21st century preserve it and how is a debate 
over where that power will reside, in federal authority, in state authority, or in some combination thereof. I mean, Medicare is actually a co supposed to be a cooperative arrangement between the federal government and the states. We now have some state governments saying they won't even take the federal money to provide Medicare. Now, are they doing that for, you have to ask them, are they doing that for ideological reasons? Are they doing that for practical policy reasons? Uh, one can't tell. So I, I'd say this state's rights revival is not going away anytime soon, just because of one election, by any means. That's as close as I'm going to get to a prediction on that one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments last night and today, and winning the award. Congratulations. Um, would you talk about Frederick Douglass for a moment <laughs> and his contribution to the abolitionist movement and to the Civil War that, that occurred and his, his contributions there? Thank you. I'll try a quick answer to that. I, as the gentleman knows, that. I'm writing a new biography of Douglas. Never ask a biographer in the middle of writing the biography <laughs> for a, a quick, quick answer about the life of the person he's waking up every morning with. Um, Douglas is the greatest African American of the 19th century, one of the greatest in our history. His greatness is essentially in his voice. And actually, I'm going to call my biography, I think, um, Frederick Douglass' biography of a voice. Words were his essential weapon. He was never elected to any office. He held two or three appointive offices in the federal government late in the 19th century. Um, he held the office of U.S. Minister to Haiti. Uh, but he never was elected to anything. His sanction of power was essentially in words. He's the, one of the greatest examples we have of words as leadership. And we know other figures in our history. Martin Luther King never elected anything either. <laughs> we remember him in his words. Um, now, Douglas will always have a place in a certain pantheon, it appears now, although it's a recent pantheon for him. His autobiography, the, the, the first autobiography, was out of print for nearly a century until it was put back in print in 1960 and then came out in three or four editions over the 60s and 70s. He'll always be that figure who was born a slave, spent 20 years as a slave. I mean, we love this kind of redemptive story in America, don't we? He's born a slave. He has all sorts of remarkable gifts as a kid. That's clear. He also has certain lucky breaks as a kid, being taught to read and write by his mistress, having some access to books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera but he'll always be that figure who somehow wheeled his way out of slavery to freedom, to fame, to a kind of world-class reputation as, a, as an editor, a writer, a reformer, an abolitionist, and ultimately even a statesman. Um, <laughs> and as you probably know, if you've been reading the press, there's even an article about it in today's New York Times, there's been a statue of Douglas that's been done since 2007. They've kept it off in some building. And as an act of bipartisanship, the Congress just voted to put Douglas, this, they can get this done. This, this is, we have to stand up and applaud them. They actually voted putting Douglas in Statuary Hall. Now, I can tell you, I know a lot of people in this country for whom that day will be terribly important not the least of which uh, is Nettie Washington Douglas and her son Ken Morris, who are the direct descendants of Douglas. Nettie is Douglas's great-great-granddaughter, and Ken is great-great-great-grandson. They run something called the Douglas Family Foundation, which is devoted to schools and to the teaching about abolitionism in the schools. The first thing I did when I, when I, I got a, a link about the vote in Congress is I emailed Ken tell him, Ken, have you heard? Well, of course, he'd already been told the day before. Um, um, but, you know, there was a time when it was inconceivable that Frederick Douglass would have any place in our, our uh, civil religion, but he will now. And actually, statues, as you may know, of Douglass have been appearing. And, and this gets a little dangerous, actually. When a person starts getting a lot of statues, that's usually the time when people just start forgetting them. Oh, he's got a lot of statues, must be important, you know, you know. And there's a great, there was, was a big statue at the 
corner of 110th and Central Park West in New York. Uh, last year, I had the incredible privilege of speaking at the dedication of a statue of Douglas on the courthouse lawn in Easton, Maryland, which is where he was a slave. Uh, it took 10 years of a local, com and the Eastern Shore of Maryland, as some of you may know, was always far more Confederate than the Western Shore. And it took some 10 years of a biracial committee in that county to finally get the city council to vote four to one to put this statue of Douglas on the courthouse lawn. That's the same courthouse where he was held in jail after his escape plot from slavery was betrayed um, in um, 1835. And the most remarkable thing about it was not only the turnout of thousands of people to dedicate a statue to Frederick Douglass, but right next to him, 20 feet away, is the ubiquitous Confederate monument that's in the courthouse lawn of almost any county seat in any southern state. And there's the Confederate monument that says, to the boys of Talbot County. And uh, one of the 11 or 12 speakers uh, during the ceremony that morning got up and spoke before me and got up and said, now what we have to do is take down that Confederate monument. And when I got up to speak, I said, no. Never take that Confederate monument down. Leave it there. That juxtaposition needs to be there, especially since I had just noticed that morning one of the names on the Confederate monument was Edward Covey's son. Edward Covey was the overseer, slave breaker to whom Douglas was assigned by his owner Thomas Auld when he was 16 years old, who beat the Dickens out of Douglas for a year and tormented and tortured him. And when I saw that Covey's son was on the Confederate monument, I said, keep it there. <laughs> Let Douglas be pointing toward that monument. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, we could go, let's do a seminar on Douglas at some point. Uh, Words and language, that's how we remember. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Blight, in, in speaking about civil rights today, uh, the question comes to mind about uh, voting rights. Yes. It wasn't so long ago uh, in the South where in order to be able to vote, you had to pay a poll tax. Yes, sir. And uh, where in order to be able to vote, you had to be able to quote parts of the Constitution and answer issues about the Constitution. Sometimes they made them count the jelly beans in a jar, too. That, that must have really been fun. We don't use that today, but a number of states, particularly those with Republican majorities in the legislature and the governorship, they've set up a new set of rules based upon the claim of voter fraud. Yes. And that has been to require uh, people to produce a identification with a photograph, yeah. a photograph of driver's license or something similar. Yeah. Uh, to what respect, what, what, what regard, what respect do you feel that those new rules in many ways are similar to those that were used earlier uh, to repress the vote of minorities and particularly of, uh, of blacks? The laws are different. The aims, very similar. Uh, I'm on record on this, as some of you may know. I had an op-ed in the New York Times a week ago today, which I'm still getting emails about where I actually used Frederick Douglass uh, as an example. One of the first things Frederick Douglass did when he escaped from slavery to New Bedford, Massachusetts, is that he registered to vote. He registered twice, in 1840 and 1841, by paying $1.50 local tax, which is what you had to pay. His name is handwritten into the tax rolls for 1840 and 1841 in New Bedford. And he registered under what by then was his fourth name. Frederick Douglass was not his birth name. It was the fourth name he had taken by that point in time. He could produce no birth information whatsoever. He did not even know who his father was, and he was utterly and completely an illegal immigrant in Massachusetts. He was property. He was a fugitive slave. He committed voter fraud. We don't know precisely when he first voted. Anyway, I just used that example in the New York Times op-ed to say a few things about voter ID laws. Well, look. I came prepared for this question. Um, I st I've been looking at the early, uh, they were called black laws. This was in northern states. I mean, forget for the moment about decades of Jim Crow laws. Forget for the moment the explicit denial of the right to vote in all of the southern states from 1890 up to about 1915. But those earliest anti-black voting laws came in the northern states. 
In 1811, the state of New York passed a law which was framed in the same language as today to deny blacks the right to vote. It was framed as, quote, to prevent, I'm sorry, acts, the law was, it said, quote, acts to prevent frauds and perjuries of elections and to prevent slaves from voting. Perjuries and fraud. Black people voting meant perjuries and fraud in our earliest history. Now, some of the people enacting these laws perhaps don't even know this history. I'd hate to think that's true, but they may not. They may not even know how they are insulting millions and millions of, of African Americans whose fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers went through generations of being denied the right to vote. And that anything, whether it's an early voting hours rule, a voter ID rule, anything that makes it harder to vote has a visceral history in this country. And I wish, I just wish, I mean, you asked, this is an opinion forum, I just wish one Republican would stand up and say, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea, restricting the right to vote. Maybe it's just not such a good idea. But not one has that I know of. If you know one, let me know, please. Hello. Whether it'll work remains to be seen. 23 states have passed some form of voter ID, hours restrictions, purges of roles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the past year. Yes, ma'am. So, so much of U.S. history has gone transnational uh, these days, and so I was wondering. That's the buzzword. Yeah. So, so, so my I, graduate students can't speak without using the words. <laughs> oh, maybe you're one of them. Sorry. <laughs> Right. So I was wondering then what you might have to tell us about um, how the story of the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement might uh, play out in larger global trends or themes. Oh, my. Uh, it does, without a question. In fact, the, there are now whole conferences on this. Of, you know, the Civil War is a transnational event. Uh, God knows it had enormous impact on the Atlantic world. Uh, it had enormous impact on Great Britain's economy, its navy, its politics, its internal politics. Uh, th there's a marvelous literature on, for example, the way the American Civil War played out in Great Britain. Uh, one of the best books on that is by a historian named Richard Blackett. Uh, it's called Divided Hearts. Uh, the, the incredible debate that, that Britain had within about whether to support, how to support the meaning of that war over in America. Uh, what a divided America might mean to them, what a united America might mean to them, and what the end of slavery would mean to them. Uh, take the relationships with Mexico. I mean, we had just fought the Mexican War, uh, right? Uh, within the same generation as the Civil War broke out. Um, what would the borders of the United States be? Or, or take the run-up to the Civil War, if you want to get transnational about this. No less than three presidential administrations in the 1850s all tried in one way or another to annex Cuba. And they came very close to doing it. Even the Buchanan administration, the last one of the 1850s. All kinds of machinations. Now that interest was largely, almost entirely by Southerners who wanted to expand their slaveholding republic. And imagine if the South had gotten Cuba or the United States had annexed Cuba, the largest sugar producing place on planet Earth at that point, with its, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of slaves. It didn't, that it didn't happen was a product of the sectional politics of the 1850s. Northerners, most Northerners, not all, would simply never go along with it. So I could go on and on with, with But the meaning of emancipation, the meaning of that <coughs> destruction and reinvention of an American republic over here to so much of the rest of the world is profound. We saw this, just one last little example, in 2009, when the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial occurred, uh, you couldn't miss it if you had one eye open. There were conferences all over the place on Lincoln. And I went to about seven of them until I just got worn out by them. And I'm not even really a Lincoln scholar, but I went, the, the most interesting one I went to was in Oxford, England. It was called The Global Lincoln. It was amazing. And there's a book out now, a book of the essays from that conference. And by the way, my 
my assignment for that conference was to write, to give the paper on that foreign country called the American South. I mean, all the rest of the speakers were talking about India and Brazil and Russia and all over the world. In fact, for the British Isles, they had speakers on Scotland, Ireland, and England. There's a different Lincoln depending on what part of the British Isles you go to. Boy, has Lincoln traveled well around the world, usually in his language. It's amazing how people were learning the Gettysburg Address in India in the early 20th century. I mean, you're, you're stunned by that. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the, and, and, and of course, there's, a, there's, a, there's an economic, uh, mercantile, global element to the American Civil War. There's an economic history of the American Civil War that is truly global when you start thinking about the cotton trade. That, that's an answer as a list. Sorry about that. <laughs> Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring David Blight, professor of history at Yale University and the Annisfield Wolf Book Award winner. Thank you, Professor Blight. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. <laughs>